Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Catherine Kowalczyk, and uh, welcome to the Responsibility Quotient podcast. It, this is a new endeavor that I have started, and um, mostly because um, through through the journey of my life, I've um, come to recognize how important it is for me as an individual to take personal responsibility for um, not only my behavior and my actions, but also to be accountable. And as part of that journey, I've learned that uh, that includes um, my judgment and how I perceive things and how I'm able to discern information. And I've been involved now um, kind of in a public forum since, um, well, really about 2021 uh, with the advent of COVID. And and what I've come to realize now more than ever that we all have an obligation to um, become our own champions and our own warriors when it comes to finding solutions that we find ourselves struggling to um, answer and for any insight that we are able to garner and and for changes that we need to make. And without this personal responsibility, it's really um, quite challenging. A lot of people, especially in this society where um, we're, we're more likely to label somebody as a victim rather than uh, empowering people to um, be their authentic selves and to participate fully in all aspects of their life. I want to be exploring uh, over the next little while uh, the notion of responsibility and uh, how we can reclaim our personal responsibility in our personal professional life, but more so um, within our civic duty as well. So as part of the launch of the Responsibility um, Quotient podcast, I have a special guest on today, uh, Shauna Sundell with the Irreplaceable Parent Project. Uh, this project is quite important, especially now if you've been following um, the news, you'll note that parental rights are at the forefront of the discussion today, especially with um, subjects like MAID and transgender issues. Uh, Shauna Sundell has been a champion since 2018 when she um, formed and um, spearheaded the, ir uh, the response, um, Irreplaceable Parent Project. And really, from what I can tell, and after speaking with Shauna, uh, who's been traveling extensively across the province of Alberta um, over the last little while, her goal is to, first and foremost, inform and educate parents about the bigger picture and and her message I think is to make sure that parents aren't sidestep and empowering people um, to understand not only what the issues are but also empower them to provide them solutions. Um, Shauna um, realized that zeroing in on parental rights uh, is urgent and it's a fundamental uh, issue that we need to address now and she's open and excited to work with governments and organizations in drafting and preparing legislation for instance and working with these bodies to help inform them about parental rights within our province and i i think in our country broadly shauna joins me now online uh, she is a mother of uh, two and she does live in a Berta with her husband, and I'm going to bring her on now, and so help me welcome Shauna. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Sh Hi Shauna. Welcome to Hi. the Responsibility Quotient podcast. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me on. Good. I think we might need to just try to turn you up again for whatever reason. It's... Can you hear me now? There we... Uh, we can hear you. I don't know if... Well, we'll continue on, and hopefully everybody can hopefully everybody can hear us. Um, I want to apologize at the outset. Um, I didn't click the right link on my Facebook profile so that 
it would enable me to put my comments in the chat for websites and um, information that I wanted to share with you tonight without having to delete this podcast and and then start a new one. So I apologize for that, but I understand that I will be able to receive comments uh, within uh, the Facebook um, platform. So if you have any questions, we'll be monitoring that as well. So Shauna, um, welcome. Um, I, I was first um, made aware of, of the Irreplaceable Parent Project through a friend of mine who had met you and I think heard your presentation um, a little bit ago. And I was excited to speak with you, especially considering all the stuff that's going on right now and especially um, Danielle Smith's most recent announcement about parental rights. And I, I say parental rights in air quotes because um, I'm not too sure um, for myself that that's the case and that um, parents are going to be actually given more rights under um, the proposed policies and guidelines that uh, Premier Smith has has announced a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'd like to um, turn the floor over to you if you could just let us know what the Irreplaceable Parent Project is and how you got involved in that and what inspired you to, to take this initiative. Oh, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you, Catherine. Um, I have just lost you. There you are. I started the Irreplaceable Parent Project in 2022, actually, after advocating for families since 2018. My previous work was in the area of home education, which was quite niche. And I downshifted to parental rights as a broader issue because without parental rights, we can't talk about things like home education, particularly choice in education, generally, all the things that are going on with health, and everything else, right? Parental rights is such a fundamental issue. I know that we're bombarded with dozens of topics that we all care about, but if we win those and we lose this one, I think we'll all be crying because home is where the heart is and it's the reason why we care about all those other things. And so I would just ask people to consider how fundamental the issue of their parental rights is in the protection of their families. Uh, parents without, uh, parents that don't feel they can act as parents can't protect their families. And it's quite interesting because the idea of asking government to give you parental rights is, I believe, counterintuitive. If you believe that you have a natural right or a God-given right to parent your children, you need to stop and think, am I going to ask the government to give me that right? I believe that that is the trap. We are at a crossroads and it's called the Parents Bill of Rights. And the question is, do we want to look like government is granting and defining parental rights? Or rather, I believe we need to ask the government to acknowledge parental rights and to act in a way that defends a parent's right, which means turning their attention to those who have stepped into the sphere of parental authority when they shouldn't have. So that's a little <laughs> bit of where we, I think we are right now. Yeah, I, I, I've heard you say that before uh, in other interviews, and I, I really, I couldn't agree more with you ab about that nuanced um, position that you have, uh, because, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, just recognized, I think I was um, five or seven or so when the um, Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, made its way into law in Canada come to know since um especially since covid because i'm a family law lawyer by training but uh and i don't do constitutional law but over the past four years or so i've become more uh, aware and interested in what the charter of rights and freedoms actually provides the citizens of canada and alberta and and i've come to realize that it's not the government's 
position to uh, bestow a right on its citizens. Um, I, I believe that, of course, we have these inherent rights, uh, these inalienable rights that cannot be abridged by any government or or institutional authority, and that our, these inherent are these inalienable rights come from God, and um, I think that 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 in particular has been a big. Um, a big problem for um, people to kind of wrap their head around in our society because what I think the Charter has done and how the Charter has been implemented in Canada and the decisions over the years, we've come to look to our government as um, the, the final authority. And over since its inception, what we've done is we've um, look to them exclusively f to tell us what to do. We've become, in my in my um, opinion, a nanny state of sorts because we're so used to being compliant citizens that, of course, want to follow the law, but at at what cost? And I think I like to hear your approach um, when dealing with um, your discuss in dealing with your discussions with government that this is something that. Um, we really need to attune ourselves to this notion of whether or not it's appropriate in the first place for government to give parents any rights. In fact, what I see in the legislation and what I hear from the recent announcement is that our parental rights are being eroded. And I can certainly vouch for that uh, in the family law sphere because the legislation um, like the Child and Youth Enhancement Act, um, you know, there we have these child protection laws already for for bad actors and people who are are negligent and um, mistreating children, and that is not only just parents, but it's other um, people that are in that position of authority over the child. And um, what I what I saw, um, what I heard when I heard Daniel Smith's um, announcement, I I couldn't help but note her her opening remarks, where she she made a comment that she wants to ensure that trans rights will always be protected, and I didn't hear very much in the announcement about parents' rights um, in that regard, other than parents would have the option to opt in. And so I wonder what your take is on, on whether or not Daniel Smith's recent announcement is actually about parents at all. Well, I think that's a good, a good question to ask. I think that this whole announcement cannot frame a discussion around parental rights because parental rights is much broader than a single issue. And so I wouldn't want them to come out and say, this is a parent's bill of rights. I know that's uh, popular right now and people are going, give us one, but let's just pause and think about what that means, right? Um, if a parent bill of rights includes only a singular topic or one issue where you're granted knowledge by others, is that really what people want a parent's bill of rights to look like? I would emphatically say no, that wouldn't get the stamp of approval from me. Um, I think that Danielle was right to not lean heavily into this is a parent's bill of rights language in her announcement because it can't. This is a policy on one particular topic. When we think about what we want in a parent's bill of rights, I think the KISS principle, you know, should apply very strongly. Keep it simple, stupid, right? Like we want to be <laughs> an acknowledgement that parental rights are sui generis, right? They're naturally occurring and that they're there. And so I think of a parallel to freedom of speech. When people note we have freedom of speech, it's great. Um, we know, like you indicated, that there's a very high bar for interference with freedom of speech in the criminal courts. 
And that's good and necessary. Just like in parental uh, rights discussions, people always want to bring up the exception. There are exceptions and there are ways to deal with that. But when the government tries to delineate what freedom of speech may or may not look like, you no longer have freedom of speech, you have censorship. And we cannot allow that to be what happens to parents because we never would have had the same discussion 20 years ago as we are now. And who knows what's happening in the future? Frankly, you can't box freedoms, right? What we need to do is protect the freedom, um, look out for exceptions that are quite critically more objective than feeling based. So a teacher who feels that a child might be in danger doesn't really have the right to withhold information from a parent unless they have some objective truths to run on. And those things should be check the box. And so when, um, you know, a, a province introduces legislation that has a requirement for parents to be told, but it retains an exemption that teachers don't have to tell if they feel the child's in danger. I'm like, that's actually where the legislative work lies. You can have a PR win and a political win and not have accomplished what you needed to, which was address when teachers get to withhold information from parents. And when we look at it that way, you'll note the presumption is we get to know everything as we should, because we are the parents. Any minor child that's in your care and is your responsibility, you have to have the rights that go with the responsibilities in order to carry out your duty that is given to you not by government, right? Government only interferes when there's a higher level problem, like you said, bad actors, not in a general sense. And there's so much diversity in families. We have to respect that. And that means some wide ranging freedom of choices. There are limits and, and that's where the discussion lies. Yeah, I, you know, I've heard you speak before and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about, um, I liked what you said in a, in another podcast that you did um, in your discussion about the family law act and, you know, this notion that we have this legislation um, we actually don't have really any legislation that carves out specific definitions of what a parent is. Uh, can you explain that a little bit for our audience? Um, yeah. I regarding can. the concept of guardian versus parent, for instance. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the foundational pieces that we'll be missing when we start talking about things like parents' rights. Because the Family Law Act, and I'll just refer to my notes here, the Family yeah. Law Act says in section um, 19 that every child is subject to guardianship. And then in section 20, guardians of a child, it says that a parent of a child is a guardian of the child if the parent has acknowledged that he or she is the parent of the child. And if they have demonstrated an intention to assume the responsibilities of a guardian in respect to the child. And I'm like, you know, we have a fundamental issue because like you said, growing up, there was a clear distinction between parent and a guardian. Parents delegated their authority to a guardian, but they were top tier responsible for their children without question. Now we've had the law, the Family Law Act in Alberta created in such a way that parents are subjected to the definition of guardianship. Um, and I think that's a problem when you start looking at things like uh, a parent's bill of rights, you're like, well, there are no rights for parents. There's only rights for guardians. Well, and, and even so, like, you know, there's been more developments internationally about the UN um, Convention of um, the Rights of Children and this idea that, you know, children have all of these rights and that the evil parents are, are um, you know, somebody, people to be afraid of. It's like being presumed guilty um, automatically. There's this presumption that you're a bad parent and that you don't have the best interests of your children at heart. Uh, when really that's not how I grew up 
um, believing it was the case and, and, but that's how it's unfolding. And I know this kind of goes beyond the scope of probably what you talk about in your presentation, which I, I understand is a almost a couple of hours long because there's so much information and there's oh lots God. that I want to, <laughs> an, oh, an hour and a half. Okay. Um, but, um, I want to, and I want to talk about all the stuff that you talk about, you know, if, if anything, just we can talk about it briefly. And part of that is going to include made, but um, what I see is this, you know, I, I come from it from more of a political perspective, even though I'm a lawyer, um, the law certainly um, overlaps into that. But um, my experience lately in the past four years has been in the realm of politics and seeing what I'm seeing in the, in the realm of politics. And I see what's happening um with the, you know, the UN and the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization. And it's a this left progressive agenda. And this agenda is really targeting the one, the the breakdown of the traditional family unit. Um, they're happier if um, there, there wouldn't be that that traditional family unit structure in place. And that's been happening for decades. And and they're also quite uh they're also introducing or had have introduced this notion that the children somehow belong to society right it's it's the government and it's the society's obligation to ensure that children are protected and um that i think is by design and that is because of the political objective that they're trying to achieve which is um, rooted in Marxist principles and philosophies. So, um, you know, we've we've done a great job over over the years removing God from a you know Christian God, Judeo Christian God, for almost from almost every aspect of our society under the guise of um, you, you know that we need to be inclusive of all religions and and that we can't breach anybody's charters charter rights around those. Um, uh, or, you know, we can't be seen as discriminating against any one particular religion, but um, what the Judeo-Christian philosophy and teachings would tell you is that, for instance, you know, children are to obey their parents <laughs> and we are to respect um, our parents. Uh, children are to respect their, ch their parents. And, but we've lost that moral foundation in almost all institutions in our life. And I think that that is by design. And so it's no wonder that we find ourselves in a situation where these laws are being created that are an affront to a traditional family unit and where the government is making the case very subtly through their language and through their regulations and through their laws to trick uh, to trick us into thinking that oh they're right they're just they're just protecting they're just protecting children and making sure that the children are going to be okay when in reality they're actually um, destroying the family and they're um, subverting parental rights altogether so that would be kind of my comment about the the political nefarious agenda and um, but you know part of Part of what Daniel Smith said in her um, in her announcement a few weeks ago, she targeted a few things. Um, she said she says that um, if, there's going to be no top or bottom surgeries for anybody who's under 18. She says that when you're 16 or 17, you can go ahead and take hormone therapy treatments. Um, that she knows. I listened to her press. Uh, one of her press conferences again before this and you know she knows that they cause harm right we know that there are definite health risks to children um, taking these sorts of um, drugs she also is excited to bring doctors into alberta to provide um, this registry of preferred doctors who are going to be able to provide this surgery it's not sure how much of this is government funded or not um, 
people and then she goes on to talk about people who are or kids who are under 15 will require the consent of the parent if they want to change their name or pronoun within the schools and and that parents will have the opportunity to opt in their child when this sort of education or indoctrination as i prefer to call it when this sort of information is being taught to our children. And I know that you and I have talked about this before, before offline, and I, I, I don't see how this is a win for parents at all. Now, I take personally a very hard line on the, this agenda myself. And I, I, what I see this opening the door to is further codifying um, this notion of um, transgenderism into our laws. We know that in 2015, gender and gender identity issues was um, incorporated into our Charter of Rights and Freedoms and uh, into Alberta Bill of Rights. So it's already a protected ground. And my concern is that I, and I would have preferred her to say that this was this wouldn't be taught at all in our schools like we're not going to go there this is clearly a political agenda and that and i think strongly that but for her um but for adults in the room teaching these ideas to children at a very young age we wouldn't have the problems that we're having now with um you know, many kids being confused because it's really in our face everywhere. And if we don't accept it, then we're evil people. Where in, I look at it differently that, you know, I, I see the, the, the rationale behind it as being on a fault, having a false premise that you can actually change your sex into a different sex and be a functioning other sex it's just not possible the the information is not you know it's not possible to do that you can um have surgeries to try to pretend to be something else but at the end of the day i see this this whole thing being taught in schools is being problematic and i and i also see the fact that Parents, although they're going to give their child the option to opt in to the, this instruction in their school, that this is going to likely cause further division um, amongst parents, students, and teachers. And and I, I obviously I don't know this for sure, but from an anecdotal perspective, I can recall back to COVID when everybody was forced to, or they tried to force everybody to wear a mask. And I was adamant that I wasn't going to wear one. I didn't wear one. And I fought very hard for my kids if they wanted me to, to advocate for them in their schools, for them not to have to wear one. And I was able to get a mask exemption for my son. He was getting headaches, but his preference was to wear it initially um, and my daughter's preference was to wear it throughout because they didn't want to deal with the social backlash of not wearing it without a legitimate reason and we got the health exemption for my my son as I mentioned but my daughter wore it and but it wasn't because she liked it and she wanted to it's because it was what everybody else was doing and she didn't want to have the to deal with the pressure of being singled out for not wearing it. Um, I kind of see the same things possibly happening in this situation that children are going to be singled out if they're not opt into these instruction um, sessions. And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> well, that was a lot of ground that you covered, Catherine. Um, I guess there's a plethora of things that parents are having to deal with these days, right? It's a lot. And the same thing is true with law. There have been decades of changes to law. There was no anti-parent bill of rights that was passed. And then they started doing things, right? It's just been slow and subtle. And that teaches us the power of, 
of language and the power of words. When we look at legislative changes, um, there's been a lot that has happened. And I think you touched on a very important point earlier, which is the presumption of guilt uh, instead of innocence. When you have to be proven innocent as a parent or a good parent like you, I feel like the Irreplaceable Parent Project is here to defend the concept that parents do have a presumptive good in their hearts for their children, which shouldn't be a shocker to anyone. Um, it's quite interesting that everybody's like, well, it's the other guy I'm worried about, not me. I know I love my kids, right? But I'm worried about everyone else. And that that does go to your point about, um, <laughs> it's kind of funny, a Marxist position on ownership of children. I had a, concept, a conversation earlier this week um, where somebody was kind of like discussing with me the issue of rights and how, you know, there's caution to be had around that. And I'm like, you know, we can't have responsibilities and no rights. And this is the issue that comes to the fore when we look at children. They're not born wise and they're not born with experience or the capacity to take care of themselves. This is something that they grow into. So it's quite um, surprising, but, but not. You have to look at what the underlying motivations are, right? Why do mm -hmm. they want to empower children who really don't have enough world experience or life experience or an awareness of all the conflicting um, issues around them to maybe be as cautious and careful about how they step forward, right? Uh, it makes me think of the push to have children able to vote younger and younger. And it's like, they don't pay taxes yet, right? They don't face adult issues of, you know, employment or politics in a very real way. Um, some adults avoid that too, right? But it's harder to avoid as an adult, right? And so why would you uh, equip a a whole body of people who have no concept of the implications of what their vote will mean. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can streamline what they think that their vote should do, it's like a proxy vote, right? Somebody else might be pulling the strings on what their vote will accomplish. And so you get a larger body of people voting as you want, whoever you are, right? The, the bigger picture. So ownership of the children. I mean, the bottom line is somebody has to be responsible. Whether you wanna say who's in charge of the children or who has the responsibility and um, care of the children, it is a distinct question. Is that parents or government? we have to come to a solid position on that. If we say parents, we will see places, this happened over decades, where they have inserted representation for children. This isn't through child services, right? Where you would have a particular set of rules about when there should be intervention because certain criteria have been met that caused concern. I was thinking the other day about the whole office of um, child and youth advocate that's been created in, in government, you know, across Canada. And I'm like, parents are the advocates for their children. Generally, yeah. Yeah. I would say, why do we have somebody's job who's now inter, you know, inserting themselves into this discussion saying, I'm going to represent the interests of children and youth to government instead of you. Right. Um, and so there are subtle changes. I would say that we can't fix everything all at once. That is an unrealistic thing. Politics is the art of what is possible, right? And really you are trying to affect cultural norms that have shifted and you're trying to help people realize where it's going and if they want to shift in a different direction, right? And so um, you're absolutely right. What has been a Judeo, um, Christian Judeo norm in North America has been lost to a large degree 
now I think we're seeing some of the consequences of those basic presuppositions not being there. And there will be, you know, um, reality checks that come naturally occurring uh, because it's inevitable, right? There's, there's, that's already happening. And so when you look around the world to other countries that have, you know, realized that children should not and cannot be making uh, certain types of decisions, I think it's wise of us to take that information in. Canada has become a little bit of an outlier in a lot of very progressive and social standards, not the least of one is not the least of which is made because that's yeah. a life or death. That's life and death. And the reason that I talk about it, people are probably going, why is the Irreplaceable Parent Project talking about made? This is because um, made for minors has been put on the table and the path for it to follow what happened with the adult access to made is very clear and already noted by the committee. So it will not be, you know, limited as it would initially be to reasonably foreseeable death. And it does focus on the mature minor concept and parents mm. may or may not be advised at all that their child is having this discussion if they are deemed yeah. mature minors. So I, I can't imagine that almost all parents no matter what you disagree about on other issues, wouldn't say, I have a problem with somebody killing my child as a mature minor without me even knowing or being involved in the conversation. And so we really have our work cut out for us. And I think, you know, just to give like a, a tip of the hat to what you're talking about in the responsibility quotient, we all need to realize that we need to look hard at what's happening at every level of government, right? Whether it is our school boards, whether it is municipal, provincial, mm -hmm. or federal, we need to understand the issues. I was talking to a friend today and she's like, I just don't have time. You know, her little baby's actually in the hospital. And I'm like, you don't have to look at everything, but you do need to have a cursory understanding of what's happening around you and your family. And then, of course, you're going to have your passions, right? People will do a deep dive into the topics that are most relevant to them. I think that the reason the Irreplaceable Parent Project is so very relevant today is because there is a duality of work that's required. Parents mm -hmm. need to be involved, uh, you know, in a personal level in their own life and their family. And then they need to look at what they can do in their community, right? Whether it's on the school board, municipal council, you know, we need to we need to consider not participating has been very costly, but then yeah. there's all the work that has to be done in advocating for the government on specific things like terms or policies. And every parent can't do that. And so that's what we're here to do is to take that work on on behalf of the parents who understand that their job is to protect their child and they are complementary. A child is entitled to the protection of their parent. And so they're not yeah. conflicting rights. They're actually complementary rights. And I think part of the argument that we're having today is when is a child independent from their parent? Yeah, I, I think so too. And, you know, I think we're part of this social experiment that has become quite obvious, especially during the era of COVID and all, all the stuff that happened along that. I mean, you're right that we can't do we we can't do it alone. But part of what I want to discuss is the part of the responsibility quotient, and I think that's part of probably what your message is too, um, with your organization is to um, to to um, it, not just empower, but people need to realize that nobody is going to stand up for you except for you. You know, I say this to um, my, my kids as well. And I, I have two of my own kids and I'm a stepmom to two kids as well. And, you know, and I, they were talking about, oh, my teacher did this or my teacher did that or whatever. And I said, okay, well, did you go and talk to them about this? Like, did you have a conversation? And, and you know, because I said, I said, you know what? We're not always going to be there for you. 
And it's important that you learn how to stand up for yourself and, and that it's okay to have a different opinion if it's respectfully pro provided. It's okay to challenge people in what they are doing. And I've seen over, um, it, it's very, it's very obvious to me now, but people have lost that ability to stand up for themselves. Um, and for, in, in many cases, for good reasons, because, you know, like we have a cancel culture that wants to silence any opposition opposing viewpoints um, people get fired and it they make it extremely difficult but I think what people don't understand is that we need to look at our society for what it's actually created like this debt slavery system where we've been um, where we're working all the time to pay off stuff that we don't actually need or can't afford and it's a cycle and then we're given these distractions that we are to look look over here don't look over there get entertained here don't worry about it we have it covered for you and that 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 has worked very well the bread and circus has worked very well in our society and and lulling people in the sense of well government is going to fix everything for you we know we can see very clearly what COVID did, um, you know, government did not fix. In, in fact, what, what it did do is bring these issues to the forefront. And so I want to help people realize that you have to be your own personal advocate um, and parents need to be their own personal advocate. It's one thing to say, okay, Shauna, yeah, can you, can you draft this legislation for me and, you know, go, to, go talk to, um, you know, Premier Smith and see what you can do. It, it doesn't start there. It has to start right from the source and that's ourselves and, and making these decisions and speaking out in our individual lives uh, in all matters, whether it's your sports, whether it's in your job, whether it's um, at the community center, uh, your government, et cetera. And, um, so it's, it, so that's kind of what I would say about that, but I, I, I really want to talk about, cause part of your presentation is about this notion of mature minors and, and also made, and we know that the case law, you know, with the charter, you know, it used to be illegal to kill people. I mean, let's just, that's a starting point, right? Um, we didn't allow assisted suicide. We, you know, it was never a thing in the lexicon of our, uh, or in our in our laws in Canada, and then they introduced made a while ago under certain circumstances. So, um, and that transition happened within a relatively short period of time. Like it was only about fifteen years ago that this actually happened. Where you're two thousand and sixteen. Pardon me. Two thousand and sixteen. It's only right. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, 2016. And so it hasn't been very long where this shift has happened, where all of a sudden, we have this possibility that you can kill yourself in the government. And you know, you know, you know, and it's in fact, now being something that is recommended to be um, um, spoken to uh, under certain circumstances. And uh, the other thing with, you know, with made in out in Canada, like in 2022, like for something like just over 4% of our deaths were the result of made. And I suspect that number is climbing. And so can you talk a little bit about um, made and children and, and what you cover in your presentation and what you really think um, parents really need to be aware of? Sure, thank you. Um, as I said, I think that MAID is a defining issue for parental rights because exclusion will mean the life or death of your child, right? And there's a lot of issues that parents need to be in on. I think you have touched on the fact that Presumption of guilt is a huge shift that we're seeing in many places around our culture, and that's dangerous um, because it leads to a thought that government knows best, right? And that's the wrestling match we're in, especially for our families. So since the government introduced this legislation in 2016, um, what they've allowed is for it to be called a care tool. And 
I'd contrast us to California where practitioners are not allowed to bring up the subject of MAID, whereas in Canada, they're encouraged to, or even told that they're obligated to bring it up to their patients. And so we have a situation where in 2021, California had 522 people that they had helped to their death and Canada had over 10,000. So the numbers have been jumping over 30% the last number of years, which is crazy when you think about the fact that they have wanted to expand that to people with mental health or depression, you know, I, I don't even know what to say. It seems so illogical that someone who's in a state, self-admitted state where they are not in their right frame of mind and able to cope would make the decision to kill themselves. We always wanted to offer help. And mm -hmm. when it comes to providing access to children, Again, the slippery slope of MAID has been proven. Uh, you know, on the record, they say we'll start with um, the first, which is reasonably foreseeable death. And that gets everybody sympathy, right? Why wouldn't you want to let somebody not suffer anymore? But they've already acknowledged that that will be challenged, just like the adult uh, reasonably foreseeable death was, and access to the broader scope of maid services will no doubt follow. I think that we have a case to be made for parental rights, obviously, and being included in the discussion that does come back to, can we accurately call people a mature minor without sidestepping the whole concept of adulthood versus childhood? We already have a legal you know, mechanism called emancipation where you had to be 16 at a minimum, mm -hmm. and every case yeah. was decided individually because there was no other recourse. And when the judge decided a child, so that would be, you know, a, a young, a very young adult at 16, emancipated, it wasn't for a few minutes while you were at the doctor's, right? It was permanent, and you were emancipated. Um, obviously, if you don't do that before you're 18, you're an adult. So... The talk is available on my website, um, the irreplaceableparentproject.ca. If you go to the media tab, the talk I've done this last year is called In the Line of Fire. And what I go over is what's happened to parental rights in education, law, and health. And then I talk about MAID for adults because you need that context to understand the proposal and the impact of MAID for minors. And when you understand what's happened to your parental rights, and how far that impact can go, I think that we need to unify around the idea that parental rights are quite critical. So I'm just um, in the process of writing my next talk, which is going to be called Under Whose Authority? And I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about the Parents' Bill of Rights concept, uh, you know, a basic philosophy, thinking a little deeper about that, and the whole concept of age and why we have the laws that we have. We just, I, I, I often am like, I think I'm telling people things that are just so common sense. You probably are nodding in agreement because you know it. But by reminding us all of these basic premises, I think it does empower parents to stand up, like you said, on an individual basis in their own homes. And then understand that I can do my job and I need to do my job, but in the end, uh, the families and the parents who support me are the muscles, right? If we need to do something or, or express approval or concern, I need you to step up. So that's yeah. not every day. Parents are too busy to do that all the yeah. time. Let me do my job. And when I need you, be there for me because I'm working for you. So yeah. you can subscribe and support uh, the work that we're doing. If you go to the website, you can check out the other um, last year's talk, and you can book uh, the talk or next year's, this next talk that's coming out if you're interested in doing that. So there's also a calendar. Well, I, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You, yeah, you have a calendar of events on your website. And um, Benita Peterson is has weighed in here. Thank you, Benita, for putting the link on, on the chat uh, to your website. And, um, you know, she's agreeing with you that 
you know, maid has no, no place with children whatsoever. And um, she says she's looking forward to seeing you in Duffield on Wednesday, uh, February 21st. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, I, I think this dialogue is so important. And if anything, the last four years has shown us how important it is for community to to um, come together, build, and that we all have our individual strengths that we can draw upon and use together in an enhanced manner. We don't have to do every single thing, right? Obviously, um, I'm good at certain things and you're better at certain things than I would be. And and that's the way it should be. And, and we can try to come together as much as possible. I mean, I just have... Um, so I have concerns about this idea of mature minor. I have these concerns about, like, for instance, we have these laws that are coming into effect, like Bill C-4, for instance, is a federal law that criminalizes conversion therapy, right? And it broadened the de definition of conversion therapy. And um, I, I just want to read to you what it talks about on the government of a uh, government of Canada website. Um, it says the proposed legislation would define conversion therapy as any practice, service, or treatment designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual gender identity to cisgender or gender expression to match the sex assigned at birth or designed to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior or gender expression that does not match the sex assigned at birth or to repress non-cisgender identity. And so you can't, you know, if you, the new four new offenses will be causing another person to undergo this conversion therapy, this big long definition that I just read out to you, with a maximum penalty of five years in prison. Meant um, removing a minor from Canada to undergo um, conversion therapy. That's going to be obviously an, a big no-no with imprisonment. Um, profiting off of con conversion therapy is a no-no with two years imprisonment or promoting and advertising conversion therapy. Now, the broad the definition is quite broad, um, and you know I go back to something that Premier Smith said about what she intends to do. Um, to or for parents and um and to people who are mistreating children and she intends to strictly enforce the law related to these children's rights and that's kind of scares me because um what i see happening are these laws are being are being created and then what happens is the judiciary steps in and then interprets these laws, right? And so we're getting this judge made law. And so my fear, even though um, maybe it's not intended that parents could be caught into this definition, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that that is that that could occur. And a simply by failing to affirm or not support your child could have devastating effects to that family, having the ch child be removed from the family, or worse, you get charged with a criminal offense because you're trying to tell your child um, that they actually are the sex that they are were born at birth and they're perfect the way they are and, and in God's image and, and nothing is wrong. And we need, we need you to understand this and let's fix, let's fix the whole in the soul disease that you're going, that you're experiencing right now. And this discomfort that you're experiencing rather than um, relying on, you know, what you're being told by these guardians or whatever, what you, what, what teachers or whoever they are, like, um, even if they're not full-time guardians, you know, they, are, they do have their, they have like an agent relationship for parents, these teachers, and, and they're given more and more rights over time. And because we know the progressive nature of our, and, and, of our judiciary and that the judges have turned into basically um, promoters of um, social um, activism and that that's what they're doing in their judge made laws. You know, I, I just, 
to me, it would have, you know, and I, I'm going back to, to this recent announcement because I, I know the devil will be in the details in terms of what is going to be legislated and what the rules and the regulations say. Um, but to me, this is, it's such a slippery slope. It I, I don't even, I can't even, I can't even tell you how against even affirming this idea that you can change your own sex is going to be the status quo in the province that we live in the country that we live i can't even believe that we are going to be in a situation where this is always going to become this is going to become normalized it, it has been become normalized and that we are actually going to all participate in what we all know is a lie that you cannot change your sex and that you're perfect the way you are and just just how God created you. So do you have any thoughts on on this judge made law and how this is going to be interpreted and 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 how that um how that coincides with parents and and what what any advice or or any comments around that? Well, we definitely have our work cut out for us. That's uh, goes without saying. I think that we are definitely at a place where we we need to rediscover active democracy because that's where accountability kicks in. So when there are changes to policy legislation um, and law, well, just, we, just just interrupt. Just I just want to sorry interrupt you. This idea of mature minor that mostly comes from judge made law, and that's why I bring it up. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's their interpretation of, oh, this child has presented sufficiently for this one person who has very limited understanding about the child to begin with is going to say, yeah, you're old enough to make the decision to get a vaccine. Yeah, you're old enough to make the decision to blah, blah, blah. Right. So anyway, go ahead. Well, I think the, the funny thing about it is it's adults not willing to make the decision for kids. And putting the responsibility for decisions on children, you know, uh, that that's a difficulty. There's nothing wrong with listening to what a child has to say about a given situation, right? Obviously, right? Input is a good thing. But eventually the buck has to stop someplace. And so when parents... Um, Parents need to have the freedom. You know, we kind of can circle back around to freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, right? Freedom of religion. Well, I, a lot I of these are being impinged on because we are seeing legislation like what you referenced, which is really unidirectional, right? There isn't um, the tolerance for a broader uh, conversation. And so I think going back to your point about kids having the opportunity to opt out of classes if their parents can opt them out of classes is going to be a necessary um, thing for the school system, for teachers, for families to understand that it is healthy to be able to have a, a discussion and a diversity of opinion and we don't all have to do that. There is a certain amount of irony that uh, sex education was brought in to ensure that children had enough information so that they weren't having sex without knowing how to not get pregnant and how it's actually, you know, resulted in so much more sexual activity for underage children, right? Yeah. And so um, I think- well, Let me give you an example of a family in family law. So I've been practicing in family law and, and uh, you know, the tests for decisions related to the children um, in a divorce context or yeah. a separated parent context is the, what is the best interest of the children? And there's like a whole bunch of indicia that you go through. And um, so, and, and, you know, practitioners will say, well, the child has a voice, right? But <laughs> In practicality is at a certain age, if the child presents in a manner that is mature, this happens in custody issues all the time. So I want to live with dad or I want to live with mom or I don't want to live with dad and I don't want to live with mom, right? And so 
you get this situation where practically speaking, I would tell my clients, okay, yes, your child is at the age around 14, 15, you know, maybe, maybe 13 or 12, depending on how mature they are. Um, they are, they have a voice. Um, but practically speaking, the judge is not going to probably, unless there's some sort of extenuating circumstances like major abuse happening, right? Um, or the parent is clearly failing in their capacity to parent. Um, the judge is probably going to decide with what the child wants. And this is this, this is why it's so difficult when you leave when when a when the government, if they are legislating in any of this, they don't make it clear and they leave it up for interpretation. We'll just let the courts decide how this is going to work. And I can just tell our listeners that that is a dangerous uh, position to be in as a parent, because for the reasons that I've already mentioned, um, and namely because we have a very left progressive leaning um judiciary who's who's really gung-ho on diversity equity and inclusivity and all of the buzzwords and in the propaganda that go along with that you're getting decisions that are go that are very slanted right and even i was looking um, preparing for today's um interview i was looking at the university of calgary faculty of education and the courses and the curriculum that they're teaching teaching um teaching people to become teachers and and uh, there's quite a bit way more than i would like um to see in terms of this idea of diversity equity and inclusion instruction being taught to to our would-be upcoming teachers so i mean this is this is a systemic problem and it's in actually all areas of our of our institutions and everybody is bought into it. And so it's it's one, yes, we have to become aware of these things, but at some point we as members of society, and especially if you don't agree with what's happening, we have like we have an obligation now that we must speak out and say, no, this is not actually how I want my society to run. This is not appropriate for our children. Parents are the ultimate authority over their children and laws need to be definitively enacted to defend defend that to your earlier point today we need governments to actually defend that concept not leave the door open for these for judges and for interpretation because it's very dangerous right we have this notion of democracy and how important it is for everybody to have a say. But as we're seeing right now very clearly in our society, um, there's many people who don't necessarily believe in what I believe and perhaps what you believe. Um, and in fact, um, don't maybe believe in anything. And so it's very hard to have a democratic functioning a functioning democratic society when that's the case i mean i kind of throw my hands up and say i don't even know i mean i think the salute one of the solutions is certainly what you're doing i mean i think you're empowering people with this information in a setting and it's gentle and it's informative and it's factual and and so i just think that what you're doing is absolutely terrific and um, I can't wait to go to one of your presentations. And I'd like to, you know, go to both of them because I think uh, you must get an amazing engagement um, around this to the people that you speak with. Well, you know, often <laughs> it is so much information to take in because people don't realize how far things have gone. You know, to your point in the Family Law Act, when the judge has his list of things to consider, one of my slides talks about that. And I said that this one is very concerning to me. The nature, strength and stability of the relationship with each person residing in the household and any other significant person in the child's life. That phrase is the Pandora's box that has given others yeah. equal say in our children's lives. And I'm sorry, but parents, um, the government does not love your children right? Uh, the government can't care for your children like you can. And so it's very critical, actually, that we 
do have a voice. You know, if we want to talk a little broader in Canada, this has been going on for decades. Another law that I highlight is Bill 89 that was passed in Ontario in 2017. And it basically says that disagreeing with your child might be considered serious psychological abuse and be grounds for removal. And so, you know, yeah, we, I know. Well, and I'm like, I think part of our job is to say no. Um, you know, the presumption that children are all wise and knowing is a faulty one. And most everybody that has children knows that to be true. They need guidance and love and care. They need to be taught, right? And there's definitely got to be room in a pluralistic society for um, differences of culture and differences of religious belief even. You know, there are fundamental things. And I think that a Judeo-Christian worldview that was here left room for freedom. That's what allowed for democracy, right? It isn't enforcing a certain set of guidelines without any kind of foundational issue. Now, we agree as a society to have certain limitations put on us, you know, speed limits and other things that we concur. So I, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to happen in the next nine months before this actually hits the floor of the legislature. But I would yeah. circle back, despite our recognition that there is a lot of work and so much diversity of thought around this, I would quote Danielle Smith in her presentation because she said, as we know, children and teenagers are in a constant state of biological, social, emotional, and sexual development and change. They are constantly learning about themselves, trying new things, dealing with biological changes and trying to understand a wide range of new thoughts and feelings. It's a very complicated time. And that to me is the common ground where there is a difference between making a decision as an adult and as a child. Children yeah. are entitled to the protection of their parents. Parents need to have their rights in order to protect their children. This is not a negative, this is a positive. And we need to flick that presumption back to an affirming positive claim instead of a negative claim uh, so that we can move forward. And so I am going to be actively encouraging the government and our MLAs and anyone else who will listen, including all of the parents that I hope to talk to this year, that their understanding of parental rights as a source, they are going to have to grapple with where does it come from? If your answer yep. is government, you're going to say, government, please give me my parental rights. But if we understand that that is not the source of parental rights, then our request is for the government to acknowledge our parental rights. And frankly, that's a whole world of difference when you look at the work that will come from that worldview compared to the other. And so I'm on this side. I, I want the government to acknowledge parental rights. If you need to write a parent's bill of rights, it's gonna have to say very succinctly, parents have a sui generis, you know, position that yeah. does not come from us, but we acknowledge it exists and leave it yeah. be. It needs to be so short and sweet that it's almost irreproachable because parents from any political stripe or, or religious perspective or cultural perspective will all appreciate the fact that taking that away is something very significant. So I think conservative government often um, fails to remove the bad and we need to do a lot of hard work um, with all government at all levels Right, whether it's talking about MAID at a federal level, um, I really think that we should push back. Now that we've seen the effects of MAID, it's been in place for you know seven, eight years now. Separating yeah. health care and death care is one very effective way of stopping having a conflict uh, of, of proposing that. And then should access be given to minors, right? should that obviously include their parents? 
these are all things. There's so many broad discussions. I think we have to be careful to um, not get overwhelmed. I think that as culture has changed, we also can inspire change. Good ideas can be just as contagious as bad ideas. And I'm very hopeful that Alberta can um, do some work that is worth edifying, right? And that we can refuse to participate um, with the expansion of Made for Children and say, not our mm -hmm. kids, right? Yeah. If we're willing to defend our oil and gas, I think, you know, we would call upon Premier Smith and her cabinet to say, not our kids. And that is a, a hard line. And so yeah. I'm not overly concerned about the fact that there's a position taken because it needs to be addressed. Um, you know, the policy that the government labeled preserving choice for children and youth, it is in fact encouraging them to wait until adulthood and enabling their parents to have some say and control over the access that others have or the changes that they want to make. As a freedom loving society, we all know that there's going to be other adults who make decisions that we may or may not agree with. Um, I can't, I can't make that my problem. If you're killing other people, good. We have a law. It's against the law to murder, right? But it's not against the law to, to have um, choices made that affect you. And there is a broader scope of how it affects our culture. But frankly, we have to do some groundwork, right? Catherine, I think you'd agree that there's a lot of very fundamental yeah. groundwork things that we need to just reestablish so that we all do have that respect and freedom, even to just have discussions, even to be able to opt in or out of a class, right? To be able to talk with our neighbors without it being, you know, a hate issue. It's not hate. Yeah. And, and that's something that we have to be careful with. I think, it, I think it's a fear. I, th I think really at the root of it, it's a fear issue. And, you know, People are, not, are fearful. Let's not catch the bug, right? No. We, we need yeah. to operate out of hope and we need to be wanting to um, inspire the change and to do the work, to be collaborative. You know, you do what you need to do. Help me what I need to do for you. And when I need to call on you, step up, you know, but we need to work together on many levels because there's been a lot of levels of change that have happened over decades and people are just waking up to that now. So yeah, I'm going to, yeah, we have to, we have to be gentle with ourselves, I think, you know, and forgiving, you know, that's the other thing. I think there's a, there's a, a real, and, and I, I don't want us to go too much longer because I know I've taken up so much of your time, but I think, you know, when you come into this information and we realize how derelict in our duties, we have been as citizens of, of, you know, of this province, I'll just take our province and in our country, we have a tendency to, um, or, you know, I, I imagine that people have a tendency to one, the, the issue seems so insurmountable that you kind of get paralyzed. You're in a state of like, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing. Right. Um, but, um, I really want to leave this on a positive note. And I think what you've said is, is positive. I think that there is an opportunity for dialogue. And I think that there is an opportunity to still influence an outcome. And I, I you know, I don't know if this is part of your presentation or, or, or whatnot, but I think that, you know, if you're open to it, I'd love to collaborate with you to maybe we can create something that we can empower people to um, use as a framework to um, either ascend to or have talking points so that they can um, approach their MLA and approach Premier Smith's office to let to let them know that these these concerns are real and and that and that we have this window of opportunity right now that we can hopefully influence a positive outcome and make this and start shifting the pendulum back into kind of uh, in, into a, a stream where um, children are protected, but that parents really, where it's very clear that parents are the, the sole authority over 
over their ch child and and what happens with them. So I don't know if you're up for it, but I encourage um, I encourage you to go onto Shauna's website. Um, Shauna, it's called the Irreplaceable. You want to say that again? Project.ca. Project.ca. Yep. And, and there's a list. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say um, on the website, if you go to media, you can listen to the last talk or catch a live talk. Okay, you can find them on the calendar. Uh, you can let me know if you want to host one. The new talk will be coming out later this month, actually. And uh, you can, you know, start looking at booking that this year, too. Um, I would encourage you to take the time to reach out to the government. We always have to work with whatever government is in place. But um, the current caucus has taken some big steps that haven't happened in Canada. And we need to give them appropriate feedback to encourage them and also to give them our thoughts on what this should or should not include. And so I, of course, representing the, the concept of parental rights being important and critical, <clears throat> would ask you to perhaps note that parental rights should be acknowledged, not defined or granted, and that um, government needs to focus its attention on pushing those out who have overstepped on, on parental authority instead of putting parental authority on the table as the talking point. I think the presumption of parental rights needs to be protected. Um, and yeah. so there's a lot of there's a lot of work. And so I think we can be appreciative and supportive and encouraging in giving um, appropriate feedback trying to help frame that conversation in a way that protects um, the, the view that parental rights are not granted by government. They need to be acknowledged by government. And that's just huge. Well, thank you, Shauna. Um, I always enjoy your perspective and your delivery. It's so sound um, based in fact. And um, you're just a pleasure to to have a conversation with and I hope everybody's enjoyed tonight. Um, please check out Shauna's um, uh, The Irreplaceable Parent Project online and I'm sure she'd be happy to schedule an event um, uh, with her. And so if you have any other feedback, please, you know, obviously put them in the comments. Um, Benita has been um, uh, busy filling the feed with um, some dates that you're next available. And uh, I'm grateful for um, Benina for doing that for us. So thank you. And um, yeah, I just have, thank you very much, Shauna. And I hope that we can maybe collaborate and, and, and get this, get this very important message out to um, people in our community. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight and on your podcast. Well, thank you. You're the first one. So I couldn't think of a better topic and a, and a, and a better guest. So I, I really appreciate you trusting um, me with, with this topic and, and your information. And I've immensely enjoyed myself. So thank you, Shauna. And uh, let's please keep in touch. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Benita. <laughs>